I don't know, count to 20. Okay. <laughs> Maria, did you say you were going to call our names? Yeah, I'll call your name. Okay, that's, I didn't quite hear that. <laughs> I y'all hello everybody James here in New York. If you say your page number two, I actually got my copy of the, the issues so I can follow along while you're doing your poem. So we used to do that live, and so I figured that would be lovely if you mentioned the page number you're on. It'd be beautiful if you haven't. You know. you can mention the page number you're on. I don't have it in front of me. No, the me person reading, right? The person who is performing the poem. That would be lovely. God bless you all. Thank you for being here, and thank you for having us. Okay, hi, I'm Maria Maziati Gillen, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the reading of the 50th in issue, doesn't seem possible, of the Patterson Literary Review. And I'm going to hold up a copy of it, and I want you to look at Linda Hillinghouse's wonderful painting on the front cover. Um, I, I just love it, and I think it is a very cheerful and playful image, and it's perfect color. Uh, so. We're very happy to have that. Now, I'm going to ask you, please, only to read one poem, even if you have more than one poem in the issue. Um, I'm going to thank Sue Lembo Balick for doing the technical part of this and making sure we're on Zoom. Uh, when other people are reading, uh, keep yourself muted. Uh, or when other people are reading or speaking, keep yourself muted. I'm going to start by reading Laura Boss, uh, Laura Boss's poem. And the issue really, I feel, is um, dedicated to her, even though it's not specifically dedicated to her. And you know, she passed away. Anyway, Laura Boss. I am the, my father's daughter, Redux, from Marley, March, 2021. My son shows me the phone photo on his phone's homepage of him and his daughter Marley from a wedding in the background. I see the Hudson River and the New York skyline. On her face, I see her radiating beauty, sweetness, and love. These last days have been bittersweet. I from flow from lucid to seemingly insane depending on which medicine has been administered. I am so thin and frail, I don't recognize myself in a mirror. But what stands out over these last days is Marley visiting me almost daily, holding my hand, kissing me, telling me she loves me and will carry on my memory. Marley is 16, the same age that I was when I watched my father die of this day's same disease, just as I stood by my father. Marley now stands by me. I am my father's daughter, and Marley is my granddaughter. And that refers back to a poem in Laura's first book uh, called, I Am My Father's Daughter. And I'm going to read a poem dedicated to Laura, Laura. Losing Laura. Laura. In the four league three years of our friendship, Laura was the one who kept, kept going. Who's talking? Somebody. Uh, in the 43 years of our friendship, Laura was the one who kept going while I took a nap in London or Paris or Sicily. She loved shopping in Paris, particularly in Galleries Lafayette department store crammed with luxurious items, perfumes, and clothes. We would go to Paris to read our poems, but in the afternoon, I would retreat to the hotel, and Laura would be off circling that amazing city, indomitable, enjoying being alone. I was always physically weaker than she, but now she is the one who was ill. She is the one who was dying. And when I try to deny it, she says, no, there is no hope. Laura, you, you are so much a part of my life. I won't be able to stand the weight of the world without you in it. You know how you have an old friend and it's very hard to give up on them. All right, I'm going to start first. Is Daniel, Daniel Donahue here? 
Hi, Maria. Hello. Oh, hi, dear. How are you? Okay. I'm doing well. Thank you. And so I said before, I'm going to ask each to read one poem rather than more than one poem. And don't talk before, just read the poem because we have a lot of people. And sometimes pe people feel compelled to give a 90 minute introduction to a six line poem. So we don't need any introductions. We just want you to read the poem. And if you have the page number, then give us the page number. Okay, let's wel welcome Daniel Donahue from Willington, Connecticut. Wonderful poem, poet. Thank you, Maria. Page 24, My Mother in Flickering Light. I unlock the door to find my mother in her usual spot on the couch, water glass sweating on the coffee table, kitchen behind her, switching from dark to light to dark beneath the flickering fluorescent light. It's been doing that since just before my last trip home from school a month ago, she says. We live on a street of row houses at the end of post-industrial Philadelphia. The neighbor dads who aren't drunks are tradesmen who would have gladly climbed onto a chair for her as I did to twist the tube of a bulb until light flooded again, my father's empty chair, white paneled walls now tanned from nicotine. Uh, sorry, the photo cube that still holds our grade school and first communion photos, the washer that drains into the sink, the shelf of mugs, medicines, and bills, the rot holes in the tilted floor, the back door held shut by a mop handle, and glue traps the exterminator placed that day by the stove and fridge, air thick with incesticide, and the stink of mouse crap clumped on the hidden side of every drooping ceiling tile before I stepped down from the chair. She didn't want to bother anybody, she said, so she kept the light off, cooked in the dark, Eight watching TV, tried to fix it, she says, by jiggling the switch, kept her trouble to herself, as in a few years she would, her last illness, and waited for me. Oh, I love it. Wonderful. Uh, it, is, it is great when poetry is wonderful. Uh, let's welcome Joseph. Uh, I don't know why it says Joe D. Joe Weil. Let's welcome Joe Weil and who lives in Binghamton, New York. Yeah, sorry, it's the, it's the university makes me Joe so the right. Love the Shell, page 35 and 36. I read some poet's recounting of her mother's death, the reducing of a lively woman to a gurgling, barely conscious shell. All my life I practice loving barely conscious shells. What do I know of the spirit? I've never seen it. I know what the beloved body looks like. Grows old, loses. So I don't know. Whole continents, names of children. It's second to avoid. So I don't know. Some practice loving barely conscious. What happened? Oh. So hey, can I you hear me? It's wrong. Can you hear me? I no idea why that's What? Well, you can't hear me. I, know I have no idea why it did it. Obvious, my, my connection must be bad. I don't know. You, right. you have somebody else go, Maria. I don't want to hold anybody up. I don't know why. It's worth waiting for. All right. Okay. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? And now we can hear you. All right. All my life, I practice loving barely conscious shells. What do I know of the spirit? I've never seen it. I know what the beloved body looks like. It grows old, loses steps, whole continents, the names of its own children. It steps back into a void out of which it came. I collect the shoes, the photos, the implements by which we call one person a success and another a failure. I think how silly it all is, how the child who has never loved grieves and is fiercely loyal, and the child too well loved skips the funeral. I think Absalom, the young concubine of King David, her breasts used merely to warm an old man's feet. Love 
the shell, the spirit whispers, at the ground zero of being who is not helpless, what's not a scandal. Let the intelligent folks prattle on about agency and quality of life. At the core of the universe, there is an entrance and an exit wound. I think of Mary weeping at the tomb of Christ. A nun once told me that the risen body is 15 years old forever. I was 15 then and miserable, covered in acne. And I said, well, sister, thanks a lot. <laughs> My mother, 50, morphine dripped into barely audible groans, was like a pea pod in November. This little dried out husk I covered with a patchwork quilt and loved beyond all quality of life. Love the shell, give yourself wholly to what can no longer return your love. Be unwise, futility is Grace's awkward sister. She drags her twisted foot down all our stairs. Learn to love her and Christ will appear gathering your sorrow, telling you to touch the wounds, to put your fingers in the side. She is his bride, Bethlehem, not that jewel city, the manger and the sty, not the mansion. No gaudy mumbo jumbo, no piety made pretty with a votive, but the species of broken bread. What we consume and what consumes us, this palsied hand we hold for nothing, our own hands beginning to shake. Thank you. Yo, that was beautiful, beautiful, and well worth waiting for. Um, next person is Ken Rockowitz from Caesar. Caesar. Cedar Grove, New Jersey, Ken Ronkowitz. Ken? Yes. This is a short poem. It's on page 40. It's called April. I sing to the robins. I think somebody's mic is open. Joe, maybe. Oh. I sing to the robins that follow me in the backyard as I rake the last of the winter's leaves and acorns. They are happy for my work that reveals their meals. I praise the green sedum that covers bare spots with bright spring color without my intervention. Nature hates a vacuum and bare soil. Here is a chorus for the honeybee that I lifted from the birdbath who might have stung me, but did not. We both took a chance. And this tiny ode is for the weathered bench where I sit to rest from my garden singing. It is close enough to home, far enough to be alone. Beautiful, Ken. Thank you so much. Uh, Maria Jura from Staten Island, I think. Maria Jura from Staten Island. Is she here? I am. Hi, everyone. Hi, Maria. Um, Page 325, the poem's titled Sunday. I wanna write the memory not yet written, the people, food, music that crowded our corner house in Diker Heights all those Sunday afternoons. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, relatives from Italy and Argentina in our dining room with its glass ceiling and chandelier the bow bay window that looked out onto 12th Avenue with its emerald squares of lawn. The solid mahogany table with its trunk-like legs and two leaves blooming with conversation and laughter, my mother's sauce and fresh pasta steaming from the bone china and the good crystal from the break front filled with burgundy wine. After dinner, cannoli and rum baba dressed up on white doilies, espresso served in doll-sized cups, and Mario Lanza and Sergio Bruni singing in our stereo. Or the day Mario Bate signed albums in our living room, his Neapolitan tenor pouring through the house. My mother's hair piled high on her head like a queen as she served course after course, barely sitting to take a bite. My sisters and I, her blue-eyed charges, helping to clear dishes, entertain guests. My father at the head, in pastry-stained uniform, regaling everyone with stories. If I close my eyes, I am there, 
can see the light coming in the window like another guest, can taste the love and song, the thrill of being young. If I close my eyes, I see those Sundays were another mass, another Eucharist, a glimpse of the banquet to come. Mm. Very wonderful, Maria, thank you. Um, okay, and now Ruben from Rangbeck, New York. And now I know I saw you before. And now, am I shut off? Am I muted? Am I muted? I'm okay. I know she's here, I saw her a minute ago. And now, let's make sure I'm done. I am unmuted, right? Yes, she's there. She's ready. Oh, go ahead, Anel. I know I saw her one second ago. I do that. Now you can hear me? Can now you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. For my mother. Walking on Union Street in Brooklyn, I feel cold air moving through my heart space. You were dying all along, but I couldn't see it. Three months ago, I was like a small child awakened from a game of make-believe. Cypress swamps, pine woods, bayous. Back in Louisiana, we daughters stood by your coffin bleeding. Now every month when my blood flows, I feel you dying. You gave me myself and with large warm hands took me back. You were the first to love me, but it was never enough. You gave me my appetite for love. I'm sitting under a weeping willow in a public garden. It's early spring and its branches sway like long yellow green hair. I missed your last words. Daddy couldn't understand your Lithuanian, but he said you had the sweetest smile as your eyes widened. <laughs> I hear men, excuse me, <clears throat> I hear men and their machines and the wind swishing through the willow trees and I hear a bird in the bushes. I feel my body pressing the stone I'm sitting on and think of how you loved rocks. Amethyst and agate, jasper and petrified wood and trees and water and soil and birds and beasts and fish and flowers and air. You loved life more than anyone I ever knew. I'm sorry. I never knew anyone who loved life like you did. You gave me my desire to live. I'm thinking of your body being undone underground in that small Southern town that body within which I began to be this person I am, that body I napped beside as a little girl. I'd scratch your palm as I sucked my thumb, curling towards you on the bed, afternoon sun coming through the slatted blinds. I'm thinking I was not nothing before I became something inside you, and you're not nothing now. My being grew a body inside the body you've shed. I want so badly to hear you laughing, but that's only my body longing for what bodies know being by. I close my eyes and feel us singing a silent song we don't need bodies for. Wonderful. Thank you, Annel. Um, next is Anna Citrino. Is Anna here? Yes, Anna I'm here. I'm here. From Stokewill, California. Moved newly to Sonoma County. Yeah. Anna Citrino. Hey, I'm reading a piece called At Cuneo's Bakery, North Beach. And North Beach is in uh, San Francisco. Step into the bakery and enter into another time. It's America, but it's Italy too. A bell clangs against the glass door when a customer walks in. 
the old world's yeast rising into bread bins filled with loaves dusted with flour. It's not a polished place of bright lights or glossy photos hung on the wall. It's a world of loud chatter and older women dressed in black lace-up shoes, aprons tied around their backs. One who notices you lingering over the focaccia and the fragrance of new, new loaves walks away from her work behind the counter to greet you. Then stuffs your bag with extra bread when, when, when you leave carrying the same pastries your father brought you to taste as a child. Chocolate filled sugar dusted delicacies melting in the mouth. A grand communion wafer that takes you home to a place you didn't know you'd lost until you found its sweetness calling you from somewhere deep inside your body saying, come closer, get to know me. This bread, these pastries hold the world wanting to tell a story. You don't need to be heroic, famous, or have to have done great deeds. Centuries of culture have sifted through you. It's enough to let hands carry the knowledge of making the daily bread, allowing the world again and again to taste its wholeness. Thank you, very good. Um, next, we have Barbara Crooker, Barbara Crooker uh, from Fogelville, Pennsylvania. Thanks, Maria. Were we in Venice or was it a dream? Did we see palazzos, villas, churches floating on their own dreamy reflections, the material world rendered immaterial? Bridges, domes, spires, roofs, all illusory? No land, just water. Thomas Mann called it half fairy tale, half tourist trap. Did we really ride on water? Vaporetti, gondole, traghetti? Eat squid in its own ink, sepia al nero and polenta? Listen to Vivaldi in an old church? Stop to see the moon rise over the Academia Bridge? Eat two gelatos a day. Take a boat in the Laguna, flat, rippleless dreamscape to an isola where they pulled molten glass like taffy, swirling it into petals, garlands, mia fiori. Or visit Pirano, fishermen's cottages painted in an arcabaleno pazzo, garish red, bilious green, screaming yellow, electric blue, the sky would be embarrassed to wear. Nothing solid, not buildings, but the doubles of buildings shimmering on the canals. Was this conjured by an enchanter? Each night on our hotel terrazza, we had a spritz, aperol or campari, garnished with orange chunks, pineapple slices, cherries, a libation, and a fruit allowance, all in one glass. The sky is rubbed smooth, smudged with all the pinks and blues of an abstract pastel. I am wearing hand-blown black earrings spangled with gold, the night sky in each ear. I hope I never wake up. Wonderful. Okay, Halim Michaels. Halim, did I Hi, see Maria. you? I am. Hi. God. There she is. Okay. <laughs> I mean, is Colleen Michaels from Beverly, Massachusetts? One day we were full, full and flush. I draped my bathing suit over the porch railing, right near the mailbox, now empty of worry. Take out the haddock that I had been intending for a school night dinner. I let it swim in olive oil and sweet paprika. I slice garlic while my hair is wrapped in a towel. Squint and I'm an album cover. Our kid doesn't even care that we are cooking disgusting fish in our underwear, totally <laughs> embarrassing her and not getting Chipotle from the mall. She has a new iPhone. We cheated death yesterday, not killing each other at the AT&T. Right now, all she knows is that her parents are gross, but love her love each other, and will come to love her iPhone. We drink wine in short glasses. We take the fish, blistered and red, out to the table. 
we sit under the purple vine that we did nothing to make beautiful. It just grew beautiful. We stuff our mouths with olives and you would swear we were having lunch in the Azores. We half expect Anthony Bourdain to show up and kick back with us, compliment my husband on his hairy chest of breadcrumbs, proclaim, this is how you live. He'd kiss my cheeks and leave paprika stains. He'd even text something to our kid from his identical new iPhone, something like, tough life, kid and she'd get his sarcasm and respond with an emoji that signified, I know, I love them too. Thanks. Wonderful, Colleen. Really wonderful. Uh, okay, uh, Kevin Carey. I know I saw him a minute ago. Kevin? I know he's here. I saw him one second ago. Kevin Carey, where are you? No, I know I saw him. At least I think I saw him. Okay, I, don't I guess see him on the list, Maria. Uh huh? I don't see him on the list. Uh, he's on my list. I don't know. No, he's uh, not on the attendance list. He's not in the participants list. Um, oh, well, but he's in the, he's in, in other words, she gave me the list of who's supposed to be reading. Right, but not everybody is here. We okay. only have um, 30, 34, including you and me. So okay, we have 32, so um, Kevin, 32 Kevin readers Powell, here. Is Kevin Powell here? I don't see him either, Maria. Okay, uh, so the next reader is Adele Kenny. I hope she's here. Adele Kenny's from Fanwood, New Jersey. I'm here, Maria. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, but I can't find you. But anyway, I know I'm you're right there. next to you on the screen. I don't know where I am on your screen. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, it's been said that you can pick your friends, but not your relatives. Things you're told. It's funny how things you're told as a child stay with you. How certain people get into your head and stay there. I had an aunt who did that. When she walked me to school, she whipped my legs with a willow branch because I cried and didn't want to go. She told me I was bad, that God kept a book in which he recorded every time I misbehaved. She said that God and Santa worked together. And just like God, Santa kept a list of all the naughty things I did in the time between one Christmas and another. He kept a list and checked it twice, just as the song said. When I was three or four, my parents took me to Bamberger's where I sat on Santa's lap. Too terrified to cry, I could only stare at him and say nothing. Someone took a picture and there I am forever held in sepia terror. I was sure I was doomed. My aunt said the marks on those lists were forever. I imagined them unmovable as the stones that lined our driveway and me with no way to lift myself above them. When the snow came that winter, it covered everything, including the driveway stones I knew were still there. That Christmas Eve, I shivered into sleep, expecting nothing. Del, thank you very much, wonderful poem. Uh, Bruce Bennett, is Bruce here? Bruce Bennett, I swear I saw, saw him. He's here. Bruce yeah. Bennett. Can you hear me? Yeah, Bruce Bennett is from Aurora, New York. Let's welcome Bruce Bennett. Thank you. My mother by her mother's grave. My mother, oh, and it's a pantoon. My mother by her mother's grave. This is what it all comes to. 
I am that child again, standing next to her. Why does that come back to me today? This is what it all comes to. Those words hang in the air. We are alone there. Why does that come back to me today? I can see the stone, the ground, hear wind in the trees. Those words hang in the air. We are alone there. She didn't say it to me. She didn't hold my hand. I can see the stone, the ground, hear wind in the trees. She said it to herself. She felt it. She was alone there. She didn't say it to me. She didn't hold my hand. I am that child again. I am standing next to her. She said it to herself. She felt it. She was alone there. This is what it all comes to. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, next is Christine Jelano from Windsor, Windsor, New York. Uh, Christine Jelano. Thank you, Maria. Those who like to follow the text along, it's on page 77. The pursuit of happiness. Now that I'm retired and damaged by COVID, long COVID, and the results of a traumatic accident, and am mired still as we all are in the restrictions of pandemic worries, I've taken on the pursuit of happiness as a full-time job. <laughs> Blessed as we are to have one another and to live in this tranquil river valley, I begin each day with the morning prayer of a walk along the long slope of our driveway. Weather and seasons ever varying the unchanging tableau of undulating, undulating ridgeline and the indolent curl of the river flowing down the valley to the far off blue hills of Pennsylvania. We strive always to have a plan of something to look forward to the grandchildren visiting for a cart ride behind a lawn tractor and an ice cream cone with sprinkles, a visit to the ocean for our daughters and her family, to see my sister, lifelong friends, a stroll along the gorge to the falls at Tunkhannock, or smaller joys, a ride together in the pickup to make deliveries, a rest in the lap of the leather chair warmed by the puddle of sunlight pouring in the front window, favorite songs that make our bodies remember their youth and embrace held on to just a moment or two longer. And then evening prayers as the daylight turns westward, back out on the drive, walking as if retracing the decades while moving forward into what future there is for me. The birds winging to shelter and the last of the light fluffing the clouds as the radiance melts down to darkness. Wonderful, Chrissy. Beautiful poem. Um, Austin Alexis uh, from New York City. Thank Austin. you. Thank you, Maria. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes, very well. And my poem is on page 97, and it's titled Passed Away. Two evenings after the cremation or two days after the burial, they leave their fingerprints and their insistent palm prints heavy on the living room window panes. They strive to return to us. They claw to be let into the warmth of our homes. Difficult to ignore, such as the noise of squirrels scratching the box of elms, such as the whimpering of a pet caught in a trap, giving hints without being in focus. The deceased one's hungry faces intrude over reflections and through mirror sheens. Even if they never lived the life they desired, they nonetheless long to strive with us again enchanted by the concrete, the physical. We long to say, we regret to inform you that you are dead and 
listen, please hear us. We are still alive and separate from the world of the long gone. Yet we remain silent, grinding our teeth in fear of intimate contact with the other side. More than a mere peak or peck of ghostly thumbs. Our anxious stomachs flip and goosebumps appear like exclamation points on our thighs as we perceived that the border between the deceased and the living is merely a gossamer hanging and we are naked behind it. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, next is Jonathan Anderson from Stewart's Connecticut. Jonathan. Thank you, Maria. My poem is on page 124. It's called, Let All That Breathe Partake. And there is an epigraph from the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. In Texas, prisoners escape the killer big house air by signing up for a special work gang in a trailer lot off grounds. Out there, they thrill to the squeal of bicycle brakes and hearty shouts from just beyond the fences. They must thank God for the caress of breeze under so much sky and rules that grant them the freedom to move. One, only two prisoners allowed in a trailer at the same time. And two, everybody not yet zipped up in a bag and still breathing must wear his mask. And so, light with chainless limbs, they bend to lift and stack and count the COVID dead. Thank you. Uh, next is Susan Lembo Bailey from Newfoundland, New Jersey. Um, let's welcome Susan Lembo Balick. Thank you, Maria. My poem is on page 130 and it's called The First Time She Went Back. I'm 13 and sitting on our sun porch in the white wrought iron chair with the loud turquoise and pink flowered cushions, cradling my niece and singing Here Comes the Sun over and over again. She came to live with us after the first slap, after the cops told my sister she'd better go. It didn't make sense why she had to leave. My dad said because her father-in-law was a big man in town, owned a meat market and ran for mayor, had friends in high places. My sister slept in her teenage bed, my niece in a portable crib, me in the other twin bed. I changed diapers and learned how to get a good burp, holding my niece high on my shoulder, supporting her neck, a cloth diaper draped over my shoulder to catch the spit up. I was too old for dolls, but old enough to wonder what it would feel like to have a baby of my own. Then six months later, he showed up at our back gate, my parents begging my sister not to go. I watched as she undid the latch and pushed through with the baby in her arms. I just want to announce that Susan has a new book out. Uh, and Susan, do you have a copy to hold up? I do. Isn't it great? <laughs> and uh, Broken <laughs> Symmetry is called, and um, it's out from Garden Oak Press in California. Uh, okay, next, Stanley Bark. Stanley Barkin from Barrick, New York. Stanley, who spent so Yes, I'm here. Years. Okay, you're going to read your poems. I was going to say how many years you spent editing, yes, using uh, cross cultural communications uh, books and and how wonderful it is. 52 that you years. A lot. Okay, <laughs> okay Sam, this is in Barrick, the. New York. I'll uh, Wait, this Stanley, is on the uh, Allen Ginsberg item. You can't hear me? No, it's like going in and out. Let's try again. 
It's in the uh, Allen Ginsberg Honorable Mention section. I don't have a copy of the Battle of Literary Review number 50. Hope Chest. In the long cedar chest, painted green with stencils of red cherubs and harps and hearts, she stored all of her hopes for a future beyond the tenements, the streets of sweltering summers, children full of phlegm and flu in the winters of broken radiators, photos in albums of brothers and parents, and a little girl picking blueberries by the lakeside in the mountains of grass and trees, cool and dark, full of mystery and hope. Sheets and napkins and pillowcases, bronze baby shoes and small dresses, birth certificates and tuba, beaded bags and flapper outfits filled with Charlestons and big bands. It hasn't been open for decades. It sits under a tall cabinet waiting. One day her granddaughter will look inside and find the dreams and hope the loss she lost one day in a white room filled with smells and strangers. Someday she will fly on angels' wings and dance the dance she put away in the green chest of hope and dreams. Wonderful, Stanley. Okay, next, Amy Barone from New Thank York you. City. Okay. Amy Barone from New York yeah. City. Yes. Um, my poem is on page 141. It's called Altar. Each March in New Orleans, altars of pastries and food grace homes, shelters, chapels, and schools to honor the patron saint of Sicily. Believers bake heart and cross-shaped breads to remember St. Joseph, said to have stopped a famine in the Middle Ages. The modest carpenter, Christ's earthly dad, opened the heavens to harvest the islands, fava beans, fennel, figs, and lemons. Born on St. Joseph's Day in Abruzzo's Colo di Magine, my grandfather came from a village where Pesani called him, Tony Di Palermo. In pursuit of opportunity in the new world, he renounced his allegiance to the king as soon as he landed in Oklahoma's Indian territory. All the same, I became a dual citizen, took a reverse route that calls to me each March 19th, reminds me that I hail from brave stock. Thank you. I'm fine, thank you. Um, then next is Joan E. Bauer, Bauer from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Joan Bauer. Hi, Maria. Hi, dear. The title of my poem is Bellissima. In Italian, it means most beautiful. One hour, 55 minutes, Italy, 1951. Long ago, my sister was the voice of the Paradise Theater, singing the coming attractions like a canticle of faith. In the land of matinees and enchantments, I was the believer, she was devout. We had our saints, Cagney, Garland, Hepburn, Capra. Even now, our hands clutch DVDs like a rosary. Should we pray for a blessed visitation? Would we settle for the second coming of Fred Astaire? <laughs> In my sister's birth year, Lucchino Visconti shot Bellissima, a gritty claustrophobic satire with the fearless Anna Magnani as Maddalena, a working class mother with big dreams for her spindly five-year-old Maria. Magnani plays the mother as full-throttled diva and whirlwind. 
while Visconti, a Marxist and neorealist, skewers pesky neighbors, rapacious hairstylists, and drama teachers, the cynical would-be seducer who bilks Madalena out of a fortune as she preps Maria for her audition as the prettiest girl in Rome. Visconti gives us dilapidated tenements set against Rome's fantastic film world. Heartbreaking as the child sobs, abandoned and forgotten while her mother wanders Rome in crazy machinations, the spell broken when Studio Flax mock the child and Madalena, freed of her obsession, damns them all. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Gabriella <laughs> Gabriela M. Belfilio. I love your name. Gabriella M. Belfilio from Brooklyn, New York. Thanks so much, Maria. Um, I don't have the book in front of me, but from memory, I think it's page 129. It's um, the title is Prodigal Lover. It's 149. Lover. I wake to untamed rain flooding my head. I love the music, the drops on the aluminum awning canopying this house where we met. I listen in bed for hours. The downpour turns the curb's edge into a river, like the kind my brother and I would raise sticks down, sprinting to the end of the block to see who's won. I wonder why you're streaming into my life again as it's starting to burst forth. Why I want you to. Different gender, no cocaine, same electricity when I'm near you. For my birthday, you bring me interpreter of maladies, soft chocolate chip cookies, slow R&B. Show me, show me the stitches that crisscross your chest like a treasure map. You ask if I want to hear the truth or lies. I say both, knowing that's what you're best at. Mm. Love that last line. Um, <laughs> Next is Terry Bonhorse Blackhawk from Hamden, Connecticut. Terry. I never heard that other name. No, it's, uh, Terry's not uh, on the list, Maria. Okay. She's not on the Zoom uh, list. Ron Bremer, Glenwick Bridge, New Jersey. I saw him before. Ron good Bremer. Morning, everyone. Or, yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. That recliner. My father had a favorite chair on which he sat for years and years. On those tired evenings when he came in from hammering shingles on roofs or snowy days, having finished shoveling and every type of time in between. That chair was there for him to rest on. He later sat there in his Parkinson funk Realizing he would never get better, he sat in that chair till the day he made his final pilgrimage to hospital. The chair came down to me somehow, its blistered seat and back crying out. So I paid a small fortune to have it remade with fine and fancy fabrics and colors. We set it in a proper place where we rarely ever enjoyed its comfort, but could view its real presence. Till one day, my huge German shepherd pup used it to sharpen his teeth and claws. With its guts ripped out and its glory gone, we hid it in the cellar, far out of sight, and piled books and old plates on it. Now in my waning years, I think of how much I would have liked that chair to sit on and how much like my father I have become. I really should put it out with the trash. It costs far too much to salvage again. 
but somehow it lives on quietly in the cellar. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Very good. Um, next is Shirley J. Brewer uh, from Baltimore, Maryland. Shirley Brewer, Baltimore. Yes, I'm here. Hi, everyone. I'm on page 168, and the poem is Dear Dad. Dear Dad, 30 years after your death, I bring a silver thermos of Manhattans to Holy Sepulcher Cemetery on Dewey Ave. Thirsty grass leans in a stiff breeze off the lake. Marble markers line up like bar stools. In the hush of a summer afternoon, I toast your legacy. You savored the joy of words and the exhilarating ways a stream of humor gurgled over ordinary stones. Because of you, I imagine the world as a succulent maraschino cherry ripe with possibilities. Dad, you showed me all of that shimmering energy. I raise a glass to your light. I touch my pen to the page. The summer you died, I found your wallet in your top drawer. Driver's license, insurance, your secret recipe for window cleaner. My pink and white lady bartender business card with the slogan we agreed on. I mix well. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, Charlie Bryce from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Hi. Thank you. There he is. I'm on, uh, this is on page 197, Spoiled Dinner. The pasta I'd made was delicious, aromatic arabiata laced with green olives in a spicy slurry with sweet Italian sausage. I was thinking about that word sausage, how sensual it sounds when a broadcaster on my flat screen reported that a school district in Texas requires teachers who teach about the Holocaust to present an, quote, opposing view, unquote. What would be an imposing view of the Holocaust? People with numbers burned into their skin, just like ink? The photos of those emaciated bodies stacked atop one another like cordwood are fake? Those showers at Treblinka, Belzec, and Auschwitz were installed to help people wash up? In my mind, Arthur Rubenstein's long fingers glide over a Steinway, play those first haunting notes of Rachmaninoff's second, my feeble attempt to calm myself. How many Rubensteins didn't make it out in time? Work sets you free, the motto over the death camp gate. Should the school board fast track Proud Boys for teaching certificates or simply require Nazis to educate their children? When Freud managed to escape Vienna in 1938, he was required to sign a declaration that the Nazi regime had treated him fairly, kindly. Freud signed, but added an addendum, quote, I can most highly recommend the Gestapo to everyone, unquote, he wrote, and I hope blew a bolus of cigar smoke into the face of a fascist. Thank you. Very good, Charlie. And next, Judith Alexander Bryce, also from Pittsburgh. Judy Bryce. Yeah, she's right next to me. Here she is. Hey. Um, <laughs> so my poem is on page 316, 316, and it is entitled First Grade. I never knew the teachers could be, I'm sorry, the the lights not good. I never knew that teachers could be named after apples. But then again, 
I never knew that a teacher like Mrs. McIntosh <laughs> had boobs as big as cantaloupes. Boobs that she would show off each day under the see-through blouses she wore. Those blouses with little knobs on them that made you want to pluck or pull them and say, <laughs> hey, why do you wear a blouse so thin? One of material the same thickness as threads where you can see right through to your lacy under things <laughs> and just about almost feel the frills of your dainty pink bra. It's lining of fancy satin lace. It's so delicate, so different from my mom's thick cotton ones. Her long line posture bras <laughs> straight, straight away stiff, plain and boring, uninteresting white. There were a lot of things to learn that year besides the alphabet and spelling including the long halls to the girls' room where the commodes usually overflowed because someone, no one ever really knew who, had used too much toilet paper <laughs> and you always got your Mary Janes and toes all wet if you didn't look carefully before you entered. Two, there was the already much chewing gum so carefully placed in a wad under those tiny desks and stuck just so that if you raised your hand after you'd crossed your legs, raised it while you were trying to learn about something that Mrs. Apple called social studies, though it might as well have been named just plain boredom, you might end up with a hunk of gum on your skirt. And that glob, it just wouldn't come off in the wash when you got home, even after your mother scrubbed your hands, scrubbed her hands raw, chased them pink, red, bare. But then again, the memories that stuck the most, even with all that I learned about additions and subtractions, drawing my alphabet letters, even the special skills in reading and those boring social studies. The memories that stuck were my new friends, especially those friends I met made in my forays away from home as I learned my way back and forth to school. Stuart would usually, would usually come by our house and then two blocks Straight up Powell Street, we'd ring Jenny's door. With bouncing braids, she'd come running out, and then we were halfway there. I knew because my mother had measured the miles. From that point, we would watch the sidewalk, jump the cracks, couldn't afford to break our mother's backs. And of course, we had to avoid the lines. My mother's spine seemed Okay, but then again, who could really know? She didn't ever wear see-through blouses. <laughs> One day, we were told that Jenny wouldn't be able to join us. And the next days and the next, it was the same. Brain cancer were the words we heard, the words we stuck that stuck. We didn't see Jenny anymore that year, though every day, without a word or whisper between our lips, we looked toward our house, through the beech tree, massive, hefty, branches bulky beside her home. Stuart and I stared hard, saw only darkened limbs, soundless, hanging heavy, towards the ground. Very good, Judy, thank you. Good to see you looking well. Uh, next, Anne-Marie Brum uh, from New York City. Anne-Marie, she's here. 
Okay, where are you, Peace Blossom? Can you hear Blossom. me? Can you hear me? Never to see you. Uh, I think my camera's not working, so I'll just read. Okay. Okay. I was looking, I haven't seen you in 50 years, so <laughs> I was looking forward to seeing you. Okay, Anne Marie Brum. Okay. Um, well, let me just try this start video. Maybe I can get it. No, I guess not. Okay. Uh, my poem is called A Late Love. We found each other late in life, yet our love burned with the intensity of adolescent passion. From the moment you approached my table at the conference dinner dance, I knew you would change the rhythm of my life. The desert winds had blown my voice away, but then you came and composed new songs. Happiness rang from everywhere. Our faithful, ever-present present friend, the Mediterranean sun, smiled down on us. The bath-warm waters of the sea caressed our bodies as we swam and frolicked in its embrace. I, wearing the Cleopatra swimsuit, you surprised me with making me feel like the ancient queen. Our lives were always full of summer. Love spilled from all sides. Saturday afternoons at Cafe Vienna, evoking past memories amid slices of wine-filled Black Forest cherry cake. Evening to evenings dancing at Cafe Pilz. Nights folk dancing down by the old mosque or on the boardwalk as crowds or tourists would gather to watch. Thursday, Brazil night, found us learning the Lombada overlooking the cliff. We tried to stuff time into a thimble, but it kept flowing over and racing by. I wanted to sew a permanent pattern for, for us, but the thread kept slipping away. At the time, we did not hear how loudly the clock was ticking. Now I transport all the treasures we shared inside the old and worn shopping cart of my life. Thank you. Wonderful, Emily. Thank the you. The places uh, I mentioned were in, in Tel Aviv. Okay, uh, Peter Neal Carroll, Belmont, California. Is he here? Not. No, okay. Helen M Marie Casey? Also not here. Okay, she's from Southern Ma Massachusetts. And Craig Chandler? No. <laughs> no, okay. No. Lisa Charnock? Yes. Okay, she's from Ann Cortez, Washington. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. Lisa Charnock. Where are you, honey? There we go. I was trying. Hi. Thank you very much. One very brief introduction. A Jerusalem cricket is a very strange ground-dwelling insect that's about three inches long and has legs a bit like a grasshopper. This poem is on page 113. Dia de los Muertos, Jerusalem cricket in the full moon. The truth is, my heart crawls from a hole in the dirt. Lean glare speared by bent knees, see its swinging striped skirt. Heart inside a red skull, rose blossom forehead. Moonlight, the orange of marigold, filters among shadows onto a heart unused to dirt. Unused to air, excuse me. Every heart is a solitary thing. All it has is this drumbeat song. If answered, it's an offering. Someone else's heart we devour. My heart digs tunnels, lives on lives that pass through. Thank you. Wonderful, Lisa, thank you. Um, Maria Crimi from Hackettstown, New Jersey. She here, Maria Crimi? Yeah, I'm here. Hold on one okay, second. Okay, great. Uh, I just have to pull it up. I don't have the book, uh, so I don't know what page it's on, but it's called Airport Road 2021. 
Page 206. Thank you. Okay. I drove home over the hill on Airport Road, named so because a little airstrip of a bygone era sits at the crest. An old bi-winged plane is parked next to a new one that could be called a skipper or a sandpiper because from far away under snow, it looks as light as a shorebird with hollow bones and downy wings. I often take the long way home from the supermarket to pass the tiny airport because it gives me the joy of a child as if I could talk the old Frenchman into teaching me to fly. Though I've only spoken to him once, when I search for a dark field to view constellations one autumn night for a sun's science assignment, the old man assured us it would be fine and even let the kids play on the carcass of an old fuselage. As I pass the airport at the crest of the hill, the afternoon sun reflects off of a farmer's field that is covered under two feet of snow from two days ago, like white glass. I am blinded and shocked out of my reverie back to the present and steer blindly into the curve with nothing but muscle memory. At a new angle, I can see again. I can see the fields, acres of white. And all at once, I understand the snow of poetry, the snow of literature, because of its vastness, because the sun fools me into thinking it looks warm, because I know the farmer's field is underneath, waiting for so much spring so much work and birth and life. And because suddenly I am shaken by the loss of my friend, by the loss of all those who will not see the spring, but are snowed into the landscape, stuck in a permafrost, frost, forcing us to lift our eyes to see them in the skyline. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, very good. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce your name correctly, Nancy Cather's Gems, I, I think that's what it is. Hydestown, New Jersey. Hi. Are, they, are you there? Yep. Hello? Okay, there she is, honey. How do you pronounce your last name? Demi. Demi, okay. I thought so, and then I thought, no, she probably doesn't want the pronounce. Okay, Demi. Okay. Uh, thank you, Maria. Um, my poem is on page 231. It's titled Classic 50s Redhead. Mother was a classic 50s redhead, Auburn actually, a mom in the days of plenty, pleated shirtwaist dresses, red, red lipstick, not wild, practical in her way, practical in almost all ways. When the concentration camps were revealed nationally in black and white, she bristled at the picture of the camps, the mass graves, the hard ground. She was not Jewish, had stopped her church going when the deacon asked her not to bring her black companion. Bristled at the horror, forced her children to watch the uncovering, the bones overlapping, the stark sky, the ignominy. Bodies once having had been clothed and shod, had family, their lives, their dignity. Now that she is gone, the great puzzle that she was, and I go through her things, her practical self intact. I find newspaper clippings of the rise of postage stamps, three cents, dated, a cardboard tube of rice paper, and thank you cards from postal employees, Kay and Michael and Kathy. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for thinking of me. Thank you very much for remembering. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Really good. Um, okay, Lonnie Hull DuPont from Jackson, Michigan. Michigan. Lonnie Hull DuPont. Here I am. Lonnie there. Yes, oh, I am. Can you, you can hear me okay? Yep. Okay. <clears throat> I'm on page 195. <clears throat> and it's called Amber. And it's in three small parts. One. Outside my window, pieces of stained glass hang on a chain, dangle, twist toward the east and back, the black lead edging around watery blue, rose and amber. Two, you and your amber necklaces, you and your winter garden, 
buried in snow behind your dark house. I want sun for you, not streams of smoke braiding into the air. I want vivid dreams for you, not miles of train tracks crisscrossing in snow without sound. Three, let's run away. You with your amber, I with my turquoise and jade. We'll run south like fugitives. You can wear a silver belt. I'll wear gold bangles. We'll go where there's always sun and salt water, precious stones, trains that sing like birds. Mommy, thank you very much. Beautiful poem. Uh, wait, now I've lost my place. Susan Eisenberg, Jamaica Plains, Massachusetts. Jamaica Plain, Massachusetts is our next reader. Or Boston is fine too. <laughs> Boston is uh, fine too. <laughs> the neighborhood of Boston. <laughs> Sorry for my cough. Ravine, oh, and this is on page 135. Okay. Raviva Shahori, elementary lesson. She started school mid-year with a strange name, unfamiliar clothes, and she was fat. When the gym teacher lined us up to somersault on the rings, Raviva refused. In the 1950s, children did not refuse. The rest of us all took our turns and waited in a line, watched the large man insist, Raviva shake a tear-filled face, him insist, 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 until the girl complied, allowed his help to grip the rings and like we had done, somersault midair. Then, oh, beneath the twirl of her skirt, we saw no underpants. The cruelty of, of, of grammar school. Okay, next is Donna L. L. Emerson, Petaluma, California. And Donna, I'm so glad to see you doing well. Donna Emerson. I know she's there, I saw her. Donna, hello. There, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah, you look great. <laughs> Thank you. I'm delighted to see you and to be with all of you who know so much Italian. <laughs> My best friend was Italian and I was Protestant. <laughs> Uh, my poem is on page 200. It's a prose poem. It's called Reunion, Winter Visit, Family Homestead. We trudge up the dirt road from the new house with all the kids. It's been five winters since our families arrived together on the hill. Jared and Chris take the lead, Will and Juliet a few paces behind. We older ones, brother and sister, who form the canopy over the rest, are happy to walk at the back of the parade, the way our parents did 40 years ago after the fire. Snow covers the road and the long grass of the old lawn. We leave the road and walk the 200 yards hand in hand to steady ourselves to the foundation of the old house. We're excited because the winter allows us to get closer to the stones than we could in summer. The trees arch over the spot, but don't get in our way. Saplings have grown in the kitchen, the bedroom, the bathroom, right where my cousin chased me with a snake until I screamed, standing on the toilet seat. How small the frame looks not quite a rectangle, more like three rectangles in a square as additions were put in place. The kitchen got bigger, the back bedroom was put on, the front porch of brick. Some in 1914 when grandma and grandpa came here as newlyweds, some in the 20s 
when the depression forced the family of six back to the farm. The cherry tree still stands out back. The six maples, now gnarly and dying, still line the lawn in front. Now stars of snowflakes cover the stacked field stones. The outline of a house, once 10 rooms large. The kids pop over the top, jump into what used to be the dirt floor of grandma's home, the Dascom Airy. The place we lived in for every vacation of our childhoods. Here's where the kitchen came up, my brother announces. Now, where is the stair down to the basement? Right to your right, beside the old green and cream wood stove. Remember, Grandpa used to lift the door right out of the floor. We laugh. Well, then this must be the door to the back porch, where Pook and Pookie sun themselves, Brother Ralph continues. Yes, and over here is the door to your and Alan's room next to the wood-burning stove. I remind him, and Sherry and I slept right here with Grandma and Grandpa next to you. The porch door is over there, I point. How could all of these rooms fit on such a small foundation, Chris asks. That's how we begin the story again. Sitting on the stones of the house, some by the kitchen, some of us on the front room side, the youngest in the basement on flat stacked rocks in December. Wonderful, Aunt Donna. Very lovely, really. Um, J.A. Forgione, Bronx, New York. Thank you, Maria. Page 236. Lucille C. tells another story. I told you about my mother bribing me. I mean it in the best way. I was upstairs in my room one afternoon maybe a Saturday. She called to me, come down. I want to give you something. She was sitting in the armchair that faced the stairs by the front door. As long as you stay here with me and pop, she said, I want to give you something because you are staying here. I was maybe 30 years old. I worked in the insurance business. I didn't make any money. Mom, I can't afford to go anywhere. I'm sure that's what I said. So she handed me five war bonds. I don't know where she was buying them. You bought tam stamps, 10 cents each. After a certain number, you cashed them in, got a war bond. She gave me five. Mm -hmm. As long as you stay here with me and pop, she said, 500 each, I think. I wouldn't swear to it. Uh, Thanks, Maria. Uh, bribe. <laughs> uh, next, Linda Nemec Foster from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Let's welcome Linda. Hello. Hello, Maria. Can everyone hear I, me okay? Yeah, you, yes. All Come right, on. great. Um, my poem is on page 100, 100 and 101, and it's called Lipstick. My demented mother gesticulates in a wheelchair, hands waving like frightened pigeons trying to take flight near Cleveland's public square. But she's not downtown buying a silk blouse at Higby's. She's stuck in this nursing home in a nondescript suburb, ethnic working class, the tract homes choking the small lawns and her bitter and confined in the wheelchair, yelling at the nurse's aide, accusing her of smelling like fried onions, having an affair with my 87 year old father. <laughs> my lips are disappearing without lipstick, she tells my astonished daughter. No, grandma, your lips are still there. But my mother ignores her and shouts, Tangi, Helena Rubinstein, Max Factor, Revlon, Revlon, Revlon. And then the flood of colors gushes out of her mouth. Crimson red, coral blossom, peach parfait, 
tangerine mist, plum wine, magenta sunset, cinnamon toast, pearl frost, white sand. I remember that icon of sculpted lips, Joan Crawford in Sudden Fear, exclaiming to Jack Palance in a strange fit of calculated passion, a woman has to wear lipstick. I feel positively naked without it. My mother started her disappearing act several years before Joan's quip. Two months after the wedding and she's already pregnant. 1949 and the gag photo of her in a huge cart being pulled by the new brother-in-law. Dusk behind the trees, thin afterthought of black and her face barely there, pale moon caught in the branches. Other evidence of her long leave taking, fast forward to 1954 and the photo on the beach, the infamous picture of me and her daughter and mother, young girl and 30 something woman. Ordinary except, oh yes, for the fact that her head is missing she meticulously cuts the photo off at her neck, claiming she didn't have any max factor on, so she looked awful, ugly. The woman in the wheelchair doesn't remember that, only knows that her lips come and go, not like the ones on I Love Lucy, black and white, Ricky Ricardo and Baba Lou. Lucille Ball, Lucille Ball, the perfect heart-shaped lips and those plucked eyebrows, two starved crescent moons. Wonderful, Linda. Brought back memories, I have to say. Um, Ron Gaskill, Northfield, New Jersey. Ron? Hello. Hi, this dear. is on page 189, and it's called To My Gone Friend. He already thought the world crazed, insisted on it, in fact, made fun of the fact. He laughed, and I felt lost whenever I lapsed into not accounting for the fact. He sent me the trouble with being born for my birthday. What a necessary friend he was. Scoffer, master of sarcasm. Would he rage more now than then? In spite of the fact, I remember him best standing on a boulder beneath a mountainside of Douglas fir by the white roar of the Rogue River Gorge, smiling and proud to be alive under the great trees beside the power of the rushing water. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Uh, Sharon A. Harmon from Orange, Massachusetts. Sharon... No, Maria. I, no? No. Okay. Alicia Ask Askenaz, um, Morristown, New Jersey. Alicia? Yes. Hi. Hi. Okay. Um, sonnet for Cole. You don't run into my arms, yet it's 15 months since our last visit. You a mere year and change. By evening, I hold you in love with numbers and alphabets. Reunion lasts all day. Every talk is about Q or Queen, and the four is red. Hug you again, blue eyes, tuck and read you to bed. I attend with everything in me. The fusion breeds even your questions, ha ha, of nonsense. I hawk every flick and spin of your mind about to read. I must leave tomorrow after Arboretum Sunday trees, curled up lily pad water leaf. I insist you, cherub from the bath, naked dash to bed, bushed, final hugs. Wonderful, Alicia. Okay, James uh, B. Nicola, New, uh, New York, New York. Yes, hello, everybody. Can you see me? I mean, hear me. 
Yeah, is the microphone working? Wonderful. Page 199 is my poem. Hello, everybody. It's called Times Passing By. When I pass by someone I used to know, someone I knew more than just casually, but studied with once on a grassy quad, or played on the same sandlot stickball squad, or had adjacent bunks at summer camp or rooms in a provincial small hotel and chatted over croissants every morning. And here they are, six time zones east or west of there, now on a crowded city street where cool coincidence has crossed our paths. I risk playing the fool and say, Hello. Sometimes it seems they don't remember me. So I remind them gently though of when and where we knew each other. Say how glad I am to see them. Sometimes I will add how odd but nice is the coincidence and make to move along without suggesting coffee or a stroll to reminisce or catch up, appreciating how busy we have become, and sometimes sensing this propriety of distance, they ask me to have a cup of coffee. Sometimes we do not talk long. Sometimes we walk a while together, and I see their face light up, recapturing a season in the sand, or study session, or the last croissant with thanks for interrupting their career. Sometimes they even shake my hand with two. As I move on in years, more are the times they simply don't remember. Or they do, but worrying I'm half crazed, they pretend there's someone else, even deny the school, the teammates, or the town and times we knew. I don't mind, though, because the happy few make up for all the times that I'm a fool. Thank you for listening, everybody. <laughs> um, there's one last po person, but she might be traveling, so I don't know whether she's here. Anna Doiner. Uh, okay, is there anybody I miss? Anyone? I do want to say that, uh, you know, that Laura Boss edited Lips Magazine for many years, and uh, she, the magazine is continuing to go on, and there's a book award, but there's also the magazine itself, and there are several weeks left in the submission period, so you might want to send some poems to Laura, Laura Boss's magazine, Lips. You can find it on the web. Uh, or you can go Laura Boss Narrative Poetry Foundation and click on the link to Lips. Uh, but um, you should send in poems if you haven't already done so. And I, I'm going to assume that you already sent poems to PLR for this year. Um, thank you very much. Please remember that um, this is going to be up on YouTube channel and I hope you'll go there and subscribe and look at some of the past readings because we've been even giving readings for since 1980. And so we have many people who are long dead actually, whose readings are there, uh, but it's a real encyclopedia of American poetry. And I think um, you might find it interesting to go and li listen to a few people whose work you might not be familiar with or um, whose work you are familiar with but haven't heard them read. Anyway, if you go on the YouTube channel, if you go on the Poetry Center website, you can go to the U YouTube channel and it will take you there. Please don't remember, forget to submit to uh, the Lips magazine and also uh, when it opens, which I think is in January, to the Laura Boss Narrative Poetry Book Award. Uh, which is $5,000. Um, thanks, everybody. I really enjoyed it. And go look at yourself on 
uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, it'll be up in, I don't know when, it'll be up soon. And go take a look at her, yourself. Let's give everybody a round of applause. Now you can unmute yourself. Get everybody a round of applause for a wonderful Ooh. Great job, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Great. I, I you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Good to see you, Ron Gaskell. Hey, hello, Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> Ron's an old Good. teacher. He was my uh, first college English professor. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great, it's great to see Lonnie, uh, Lonnie DuPont, too. From Michigan. Hi, Lonnie. Hi, Linda. Oh. Hi, Linda. <laughs> is recording. Oh, yeah, of course, I couldn't. He put in the chat the um, link to Laura Boss Poetry Foundation. Right. Wonderful. Anyway, thank you all for being thank here. You. Hope you'll thank you, Maria. Take care. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank, thank you so sure. much, Maria. Bye. Be sure Bye. to vote. Bye. Bye. Thank you. <clears throat> Bye, everyone. Great. Thanks, Bye, Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.